like uh, just let me know when you want me to start showing the photographs. Tell us your your background. You uh, you ended in Romania. You had been uh, you had been posted first in the Philippines, and that just goes to show you that the life of a foreign service officer owes a lot to chance. That was a position that was open, and then Romania was open, and you headed to Romania. You did spend a lot of time in Eastern Europe or on Eastern European issues, Balkan issues thereafter. Uh, tell us a little bit about that part of your career, how you end up in, uh, in Romania, and then tell us a little bit about what was happening in the second half of 1989 in Romania, and we'll show some of the photos. Okay. Uh, listen, the, for people just to understand, the U.S. Foreign Service, you know, it's, the Greek population is used to this. You have a professional foreign service in, in Greece as well, but there tends to be more family dynasties in the Greek system than we have in the U.S. system. Uh, but still, professional systems have rotations, positions open up, and people are, you know, told uh, a year before their time and a certain posting is over that they have to give a, come up with a list of the places they would like to, we call it, put a bid on. It's just like bidding to buy something. And multiple people can bid on different assignments. And uh, I, had, I had done a lot of academic work in Sovietology, East European studies, and spent a year as a student in Poland, uh, as a grad student. So East Europe was my thing. And there I was in the Philippines trying to find a way to get back to Eastern Europe before the place melted down because you could see with the way Gorbachev was handling things that big things were starting to happen in the Soviet bloc universe. So when a job opened up in Romania, I put the bid in. And the personnel officer said, you know, you put bids in for other places, but once you put a bid in for Romania, you got it. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it, it was known as a hardship post. Uh, it wasn't the most popular place in the world to be. Uh, and the other thing that was a little bit different about it, it's one of the few, not only, one of the few posts in Eastern Europe where uh, it's an, a non-Slavic language. I had studied Russian and been in Poland, so I knew Slavic languages, but this was a Romance language, so it was easy. You could take the course in Washington because it was easier to learn language. You could be trained up in six months, whereas if you did Polish or Russian or Hungarian, which was a non-Slavic, but any of the other languages took a full year investment of time. So it was a little easier if you maybe figured, I'd like to get out there faster and not spend a full year in Washington. So anyway, uh, put in, put the bid in, the personnel officer said, you got it. Uh, you're there, you, I had done academic studies, and uh, I arrived in the spring of 1988, so it was still Soviet bloc, Soviet bloc doing its thing, but cracks were emerging. It was, you know, not something that the average American cared about, uh, but and, he, and this is, again, even a year before Tiananmen Square in China. So the, the great arms race with the Soviet Union was still continuing. Uh, the presidency switched, if I recall, in 88, and George Bush took over. If, uh, and, again, he was a very, very seasoned both diplomat and head of head of the CIA, although he wasn't a career diplomat, he had a lot of international experience. So foreign policy was a, was a major thing. The fate of the Soviet bloc was a big thing to the Bush administration. They had, I mean, big guns working on this stuff. Not just James Baker, but the people under him in the department were quite were not sort of the the, the newbies to the foreign policy community. There is. A part, although you don't see it, you didn't see it in the Trump administration, there is a substantial part of the uh, political base in the old Republican Party that consists of what we would call globalist Republicans, people that look at the world as, I mean, lots of academics do. They see global trends, they analyze them, they don't put on blinders. They don't do the America first thing. So this was a different time in American history and in American diplomacy, and globalist uh, Republicans were in charge. And as a result, foreign policy was much more bipartisan than we've seen in the last, uh, certainly in the last uh, five years. So most of these things, you know, dealing with the, with the Russians, Soviets, with the Chinese, they were nowhere near as politicized and as controversial as they have become. 
And so this was a, a there was a bipartisan approach. East Europe, communist. One day things will change. One day we should start thinking about helping them make a transition if they ever do. But in the meantime, we still have to invest uh, in the military, uh, which we were st still building up in Germany, uh, in case we ever have to fight a war. That was '88. Things uh, started. Uh, re relatively speaking, because the Balkans is kind of you know a bit out of the way, with the exception of Yugoslavia, at least mm -hmm. during the height of the Cold War. You arrive in Romania, and how important is Romania? And how important are the four countries in in Southeast Europe uh, in this overall picture? Uh, you know, how important are the Balkans uh, to national security of the United States in 1989? Let's say. Okay. Well, in '88, they weren't that they weren't that important. I would just give you the the heads up because we did have a Deputy Secretary of State come through in like the fall of '88, and that was like the biggest thing ever for a long time in terms of Americans visiting Romania. This whitehead, I think it was his name, uh, Deputy Secretary. But the issue basically is that the uh, the thing about the Balkans that was interesting was that the countries were more politically independent from this from Moscow. Uh, Yugoslavia was on its semi-independent, really non-aligned uh, pathway trying to really to build a position between east and west but really part of the east but economically a lot closer to the west than people wanted to admit but not not officially politically because they still had socialist control of most of the most of the economy but they were a special case and the minute you left eastern europe and crossed into yugoslavia you felt you were most of the way home to the west romania firmly in the East in terms of economics, but the foreign policy that Ceausescu ran was something that was designed to give him uh, leverage vis-a-vis -vis all parties. He was running, uh, you know, he was running um, the I'm independent from Moscow game in Washington, buying Boeing 707s for the Tarom, which is the Romanian airline fleet, getting Exim Bank credit, okay, uh, letting Germans, then there's a large German community in, in uh, Transylvania, letting them gradually immigrate to West Germany, letting the Jews move freely to Israel, which was a, a huge thing. He was one of the guys who understood before the rest of Eastern Europe that if you have the Jewish community in the United States on your side, you can do things in Washington and you can do things with investors. But basically it was if you have the Jewish community on your side and with no complaints, then your human rights record is not going to be scrutinized as as tightly as it would otherwise be. And so because they were not getting complaints, the Jews that wanted to go to Israel or wherever they wanted to go could not leave because they were, they were issued passports and they could immigrate. Uh, he covered that. And he was able to turn it into the benefit of getting, like I say, Exim Bank support for certain things that he wanted to buy from the U.S., which were not just airplanes, but also drilling equipment. Romania was a major oil producer, although, uh, and it's, it's famous in World War II, we, we, the Americans, the Allies, bombed the oil fields in Ploest because the Germans, who had occupied the whole, all of the Balkans, needed the oil production in Romania for the war machine. Okay. Uh, I, I, what I want to say is the place wasn't completely pumped out, but it was very, very clearly understood that the oil, oil and gas production was on the decline. Okay. okay. But for Ceausescu's foreign policy and his economic policy, having most of domestic requirements uh, for energy produced with uh, local production was a big thing. Ceausescu's deal was that he did not, he wanted to have an independent foreign policy from the West. He said, look, uh, we have built up a little bit too much foreign debt to the Western countries for things we imported. And I mean, listen, it's not, an, it's not a crime to import Western technology if you use it correctly and modernize your industrial base, which makes your economy more competitive. They spent a lot of money actually on equipment to produce airplanes and things like that. They figured there was a place in the middle for them. They were doing a joint, uh, a joint fighter project with the Yugoslavs back then, but they had to upgrade their their metal their metallurgy and their aeronautical industry. They were producing uh, an older model British 
It was called the Rombach, British Airways Corporation, an older passenger jet even for domestic use and for some export to third world countries. So they needed a little bit of investment to just keep their, their industries competitive. So they picked up some debt. Ceausescu says, let's get rid of that. The way he did it, and this is coming into the prelude for, of, uh, of the revolution in the, in the Romania case, the way he did it was to say, look, we are going to have to tighten our belts for four or five years. We're going to re reduce to almost zero any imports of consumer goods, nothing at all that takes hard currency, meaning dollars, marks, uh, pounds, francs back in those days, not quite drachmas, but we're going to reduce our hard currency imports to almost zero so that we can run a balance of payment surplus overall and pay down the debt faster than we otherwise needed to. Okay. So they reached that target in the spring of 89. But this was hard because the, the way they tightened the belt uh, wasn't just you know getting rid of French pâté imports and stuff like that. We're talking about uh, re making sure that every exportable commodity was you know, taken off the Romanian market. Consumers couldn't have it. That was food, but also energy. So people were freezing in their houses. They were the how the it may remind you, especially you guys in Thessaloniki, that have places that may not get that much heat. Uh, the uh, hours that heat was given and remain is a hell of a lot colder than even Thessaloniki on the coldest days because it gets the Siberian air blast much more frequently. Uh, right. And it, I mean, very, very, it's very, very icy and nasty in, in the winter months for a place that's only an, only a day's drive north of where you guys are. Uh, and they reduced the amount of energy available for heating. They also put controls on how much electricity you could use. So if somebody had a relative from the West that gave them a heater, or if they found an electric heater, uh, their electric bills would be scrutinized, scrutinized by somebody, we don't know who, and they would get warnings about this. I remember talking to Romanians who said, look, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to be harassed by the security services because I use one heater to keep my baby's bedroom warm in the winter, if you can imagine that. So this is, you know, the, so in terms of consumer hardships, problems getting food and decent quality food for one, uh, but the heat was the biggest thing. And so in 89, when they finally said we've hit the target, we have paid off our foreign debt. We are now free and independent. People said, great, finally, we can return to the way we were living. Romania had been living, and, and people t would tell me stories as uh, that as consumers, they felt they were fine in the 70s before okay. Ceausescu really took, took control of the place. And people said, look, you know, I can remember a decade ago, 15 years ago, when I had to open the windows in the winter because it was too hot. So uh, something that you don't see in Thessaloniki, but you do see in all the socialist countries are these major uh, centrally controlled thermal heating plants. The hot <laughs> water. Well, Washington, D.C. has it for the federal buildings, too. I mean, it's just... Like it or not. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a period of technology, and th this was is used in almost all of Eastern Europe that... They can control how much heating is provided to a city by a flick, the flick of a switch. How much hot water you have for showers by the flick of a switch. When they take it off in June for maintenance, you, you, it's summertime outside, but you still don't like a super cold shower, but they have to maintain the system. Okay, they take it off for a couple of weeks. So this is a central system. They, they were able to, as a result of that, concentrate the resources where they wanted to. Centrally planned economies have certain advantages. So, the, but a lot of a lot of hardship for the people of uh, Romania. Uh, tremendous, I tremendous, watch, tremendous. Watching a, a clandestine interview of somebody in uh, Bucharest done for a French TV uh, news program, and they said, "Please, please tell the world how bad it is. We're suffering. We're dying here. It must have been horrific for the your average citizen of Romania, especially in the big city like uh, Bucharest." where you have the secret police everywhere also, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of political oppression. It must have been just a really very difficult time for the people of Romania. 
Uh, it, it was it was horrible, and let me just add one thing, which I didn't tell you when we had our previous discussion. There was uh, Ceausescu said population's not growing fast enough. Uh, they had so he put in a prohibition against almost all forms of abortion. So what was going on was uh, a fair amount of bungled, you know, black market abortions were were killing young women. And this was, you know, both a social disgrace, but a direct result of the policy. And so that was one additional factor of sort of party, the you know, party control of the average citizen's life uh, that was very different from 15 years ago when Romania was relatively liberal in the so in the Soviet bloc. It remember yeah. Romania hadn't hadn't had Soviet occupation troops for over 20 years. They were, I mean, anybody that was there was out in the 50s. If they were even there that long, they swept uh, through in World War II, but they were gone very, relatively quickly and Bulga and removed from Bulgaria as well. So you would say that the, the regime of Ceausescu was even worse than a Soviet puppet regime. Well, again, I mean, it was a Soviet puppet regime that had to do different things okay. to get some independence. To get some, and remember, their 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 basic point was that for a long time they wanted to show that they were more legitimate domestically because they were doing the things the Romanian people wanted. So in the 70s, the consumers were not so bad. People got, you know, Kojak was on TV there. I mean, they, <laughs> they, did, they did import Western TV shows. By the time I was there in the late 80s, uh, things were so bad. Again, this is energy saving and, and uh, I mean, amazing thing even for Eastern Europe. TV was shut off. There were three hours of TV at night when I got there in 88. He cut it to two hours. So it was shut off at 10 o'clock uh, all nights, all weeknights, uh, and Sunday night. So the idea was people have to get up early to come to go to work. It's a workers' republic. So uh, uh, what are you doing watching TV after 10 o'clock? Romanians are, are not very different from Greeks when in the right environment they stay up as late and party as well, because I saw that after the revolution. But I mean, okay. the thing, the real, real repression. So they had to watch satellite TV, listen to Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, whatever they could after after 10 o'clock. But uh, I, I mean, things that made life livable in a in a cold, dirty East European country, more and more of those things were removed. So in 89, people thought, OK, we've paid off the debt. Let's see the consumer goods start returning. A little bit would be nice. A lot would be wonderful. You know, we'll we'll admit that Ceausescu was right, and you know we're okay. What does Ceausescu come up with? He decides in that spring, and then he works on the plans all through the summer of '89. You know what I'm going to do? We now have a balance of payment surplus. We've got money coming in. Why don't we become a bank to the third world countries? Why don't we lend to the Africans and make some money? So the same policies that meant to the Romanians. No backing off at all. The same policies stay in place. We just use the surplus to do something else for somebody else, but not for ourselves. And that infuriated the population. Okay? okay. So there was a chance to turn things around, and he didn't take it. So you could run the first shots, which are okay. uh, from 89. From yeah, 88. Let's show the screen now. Present okay. now, entire screen. And I have to go to my uh, – this is the first one. All right, next collage. Okay. Okay. All right. So what you have here, this is actually from the end of nineteen. The the trade fair, Bucharest, like Thessaloniki, had a big trade fair, with pretty much every year, but it was doubly big every other year. So this was one. Of, this was nineteen eighty eight, a double big trade fair, thing. You know, this is the only time I actually got in close to see Ceausescu was when he came to the U.S. Pavilion. Uh, at the at the Bucharest Trade Fair in whatever October November eighty eight, okay, and that's just an entry to the uh, main hall. But this is uh, the picture is uh, representative of the kind of stuff that you would see in North Korea, probably Albania, lots of places at different times in the Soviet bloc's hist history. But for nineteen eighty eight Eastern Europe, that's still a little bit unusual. Anyway, it says Ceausescu, Romania, peace. Right, and we zero in to get more, but. That's basically all you need. And then there are quotes on both sides. Uh, Ceausescu quotes. And basically, look, it was definitely a, uh, 
a personality cult. Uh, the TV, the nickname for the TV, the two hours at night was called Tele Niku from Niku, Nikolai Ceausescu. I mean, this is a, it was really, really, really getting bad. The other thing going on in the, the picture below in Bucharest was that they had decided it was time to, and I'm going to use the Romanian word, systematizaria, which just means systemizing, uh, downtown Bucharest. So they decided, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, deciding to take La Dadica and just raise the whole thing and build something brand new there. So they took the oldest historical part of the city, not every old historical building. There were some churches and stuff they didn't trash, but mostly uh, residential stuff. They decided right. to trash it and build a completely new district. And it would okay. be centered around monstrosity here, which yeah. this is 88, so it wasn't really finished until a year later, called the uh, Casa Republici then, the House of the Republic. But later they renamed it Ca uh, House of the People, Casa Popolului. You'll okay. see both names. Okay, monstrous thing. I mean, for embassy guys to sneak into the construction site and write a report, they loved it back in Washington because okay. it's like you know, we're not getting this much information about what was going on. Uh, but you know, even on they had work crews on uh, working on Sundays and holidays to make sure this stuff was done. But flanking this whole this main structure, which was basically a building they were, that they now use and were go, had planned to use for the uh, for the parliament, uh, but also office buildings for the for lots of the lots of the government bigwigs. But it's not a house or anything like that, as some people sometimes tell you. Uh, the surrounding it was a huge residential district for government bureaucrats. Okay, and so. That's why they raised, and so they basically raised about a quarter of the old, a quarter of the core of Bucharest for this. So a monstrous construction project, as you can imagine, made Bucharest very dusty in summer when it was a little bit dry. Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing that people here wouldn't, uh, w would not, not expect. But, you know, otherwise Bucharest is a fairly green area and you wouldn't expect that much dust, but the amount of construction made yeah. it, and you wake up in the morning and if you had your windows open at night you really have to get rid of the dust yeah like like uh, the dry islands in the aegean uh yeah. and I, ex I expect we're going to have the same thing here once they get working on hellenicon it reminds I, me I, now just yeah. thinking of it i lived in albany for a year reminds me of rocky's folly the egg and the uh you know they they tore down a a, a neighborhood in uh in uh, in Albany, and they built this modern sort of uh, government construction, and people were up in arms about it. Also, so we have it in the United States. Yeah. What's in the next picture you have for me? I think it's a photo of your ambassador. Okay, now we'll so Now let's let's move to revolution time. Okay. 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 You guys, do you have questions, or should I just sort of go into this? That's Ambassador Green. Should we talk about him first? Yeah, let's talk about him briefly. One of the students was going to read his oral history, and we thought the better of it because he wasn't really a foreign service officer. Hell of a nice guy, though. Hell of a nice guy. And his wife was also nice, and you can see them both there. And I can't tell you the hand out of the other window who's waving. Behind, <laughs> the, picture, behind the picture of George Bush. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, could, be, could, be Larry, could be Larry Knapper's hand. Could be one of the, could be his secretary's hand. I don't know. Okay. Uh, it would take a it would take a forensic scientist to figure that one out, but the uh, the build up to the revolution, you guys studied a little bit of that from what what you discussed, right? You talked about how the rest of Eastern Europe started uh, started melting in the summer of eighty nine. Right. Correct. Okay. Right. I had a bird's eye view because uh, I had just gotten married to another uh, U.S. diplomat. And she was posted in Warsaw, so I was going back and forth between Warsaw and Bucharest anytime, any you know three-day weekend or any or or meeting in in Berlin or Budapest or Prague or whatever, wherever you could get connections. And they weren't that great between Romania and Poland. So I was visiting all these European cities in the fall of '89 as things happened. But the first country where communism collapsed, of course, was Poland. Uh, in August, when Solidarity actually was asked to help form a government. And that started the wave, but the, the real trigger event was that the Hungarian government, uh, in earlier in the summer, decided it wasn't going to keep the borders closed to East Germans who wanted to leave 
uh, and leave to get to Yugoslavia or Austria. So that was the the thing that actually let what you know. There, there's there there are always a couple of East European tourists that go to some country, they get a visa, they get their whole family in a car, and they cross some border and never come back. You know that would always happen in small numbers from almost any communist country, but it was so rare because usually they would not allow entire families to travel. Ah. They would give a passport for you know a couple people, but you got to leave the wife and the kids back or whatever. You can take right. one kid, but not both. So they would to, to try to avoid this kind of thing. That was the normal tactic with passport issuance. And remember, East Europe is not a country. We're not. It's not a region where people had automatic guarantees of passports for free travel, which will remind right. Greeks of what it was like in the junta. Here. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so so there are some things about Eastern Europe that I think Greeks understand a lot better than Americans ever can. Uh, and the issue was that basically East Germany had a lot of people that were just sick and tired of the way things were and had family in Western Germany. And once a way was found for them to get out, some started getting out through Bulgaria and others, most through Hungary, just to Austria or Yugoslavia and out. Yeah, they so opened was, the border with Austria, which was quite extraordinary. Yeah, so that was, the, that was actually before solidarity. Then solidarity in August, uh, where the Polish government basically, basically collapsed. Uh, and and the Russians did not do anything to prevent the uh, the change of government. This goes back to a theory the Romanians used to tell us uh, after the revolution. They called it Malta Yalta because there had been the Gorbachev Bush meetings in earlier in eighty nine in uh, Malta, right? The big summit, and so the Romanians and I think other East Europeans chose to believe that a deal was done then. Tiananmen Square happened in the summer, I think, June of 89. Right. Okay. And so in a place like Bucharest, you know, you'd have the, you have the Soviets and the East German diplomats who normally were very circumspect in dealing with us. The only reason they would deal with the Americans was so that the Romanian security service who were, services who were watching all of us would get upset that the Russians <laughs> and the Americans were talking. No, legitimately, after yeah. Tiananmen Square, the Russian, the Russians, some of whom were known to be KGB guys, you know, would ask to have lunch, in in and you know they would they would call up, make the request. It would go through processing. Uh, that definitely would be reported to Securitate, who was monitoring the phone calls of all the embassies and had the staff had the local Romanian staff also working for them and reporting on us. So if there was a meeting, if there was a lunch meeting at some restaurant, you know, set up a week later, believe me, all of the, uh, all the microphones were in place. And this was a well-known thing. The Romanians used to make a joke about, you know, be careful, never, never pour your glass of water in the plants. You might get a shock. <laughs> this, this, this was a joke the Romanians used to make. They were so worried about security control. People were very, very, very paranoid. So, and so I, despite the fact that you know these countries are kind of closed off to the outside, you are getting news that things are changing. If they're changing in Poland, and you're finding out about it even in Albania, that's quite. Well, radio, radio, radio free, radio free Europe had a, played a big role. Voice of America, the BBC, but especially our. Our, you know, the, we had East European language services from Radio Free Europe, which was in Munich in those days. Now it's in Prague, and this was informing them. And so they basically, uh, everyone in the bloc that was not afraid to turn in, tune into Radio Free Europe, which in some countries it was a crime. It was not a crime in Romania, and the Romanians got a very clear signal of Radio Free Europe and Voice of America, thanks to you Greeks, because the broadcasting station was in Kavala. Kavala nearby. Right. So so I would just want to thank the you know everyone in Greece for the support of the West Western effort to win the Cold War because that Kavala station played a role. So thank you guys uh, okay. for that. And anyone that any you know there was a small small American presence, a little it's not a base, it was just a facility. Right. Anyway. Well, I have that, another another picture here, I think, of your yeah, that's the revolution. So okay, so we're, so we're into the revolution period, and we don't have for, forever. So let's get into this. Uh, the countries of the Eastern Bloc all went sort of down domino. One, two, three, four. The last one to go before Romania was Bulgaria in November. Right. It was the resignation of Zhivkov. 
Right. Okay. And so there was a set of dominoes. And what we were reading, you know, there were lots of op-eds, you know, New York Times, uh, Financial Times, other, you know, some of the German press said, look, you know, this the East European changeover has happened. It's not going to affect Romania. Why? And they, uh, the analysis that most of the Western journalists had was, guess what? He has built such a tough system of internal control that it's just impossible for this kind of thing to happen in Romania. He okay. has spent, spent decades insulating himself against this kind of thing. That's why he cut off so much contact with the rest of Eastern Europe and with the other communist parties. Okay? And so this, there was a belief that, that, that the Ceausescu regime would be much more uh, resistant to change Okay. And it certainly looked like it was going that way into mid December of eighty nine, right. at which time at which time we had this sort of uprising in Timisoara based on a religious thing. It was a priest who had had issues with the police, and they decided to to prevent people from coming to his congregation. Uh, Timisoara being very close to the border with Yugoslavia, some journalists were able to get in and start reporting on that. Okay, but they very quickly, and this is like the 17th of December, if I remember, they very quickly put a ring around Timishwara and nobody was going in or out. Alec, wasn't there a minor strike also uh, simultaneously? Minor, there, there have been minor, there, there were a series of minor strikes uh, at different times okay. uh, in Romanian history, and there was even one after the revolution. So those guys don't, you know, I mean, they're, they're equal opportunity, it's for them. Okay. But there were there were a, a minor strikes, but that this was not a super. This was not even a big deciding factor at this point. This was basically the Timisoara thing was what the closest thing anyone had had to a spark of hope that something might be changing in Romania. Uh, Ceausescu had a scheduled trip to Iran that same week, and he did not cancel it. Everyone said, "Okay, this is serious, Timisoara." He's had to send the security forces in to lock things down. Okay, so he's definitely going to cancel the Iran trip, and he'll do it later. He didn't cancel. He went. And so they, the population was both encouraged and infuriated that the guy decided, you know, to play his you know, non-aligned uh, foreign policy. We're out there. We're a big player in the world card, and he, he did it and didn't get back, I think, until the 19th or the 20th. Okay. Okay. Student and student uprisings were beginning to brew in Bucharest. And that was the thing that really started on the 21st. So that's a day before the picture here. Uh, on the 21st, in the afternoon, the students basically, we did, there, there, there had been a, 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 a Ceausescu support rally uh, earlier that day in the, the central square, which is like, a kilometer from the embassy uh, that we could see that was pretty big organized, but people were not enthusiastic. Okay. And for whatever reason, people, other people understood that, that, you know, things were actually boiling in Bucharest at that point, the afternoon of the 21st. And then the students decided to show up right. Uh, I would say 300 meters from the U S embassy, right on the main street in Bucharest, next to the hotel where most of the foreigners tend to go, the Intercontinental, which you, uh, you can't see, but it's sort of behind, uh, it's directly behind the big building, which is the embassy with the American flag. Right. Uh, if you would draw a line, it's really a three-minute walk from there. Okay. Anyway, the line was there. Foreigners could see it. Uh, the police did nothing during the daytime except to just form a defensive line at that point they didn't do anything the students got more and more aggressive when it got and the other important factor was it was not very cold that for descent and usually december it's pretty cold in romania but you can have some balmy days where it's 12 13 15 degrees and that's what it was okay. very very unseasonably warm so it wasn't difficult for people to be outside for long for long periods of time which is just a, a contributing factor chance so what happened was they decided after dark they were going to move to get rid to, to get rid of this very angry aggressive student uh, demonstration line that had just just a solid line. You've seen this kind of thing in Greece all the time, but, yeah. but it wasn't moving. 
Okay. Then they decided to use tear gas and, and water spray. I don't think they had water cannons, water, cold water spray to get rid of these guys. And whatever they did, we were not there to witness it. That, that student demonstration line melted away in the evening of the 21st. Okay. Uh, we went out from the embassy a couple of hours later. The, uh, the guy you saw, Ambassador Knapper, was the number two in Bucharest at the time. And he didn't speak that much Romanian, but he knew I had learned it okay. So he said, we're going out on the street. Let's see what we can see. It's only a few blocks away. Let's go out so we can get some, something to report to Washington. There was, they had already set up a big task force in Washington to watch this, but this was not unusual because they had task forces every other East European revolution that they put up for a few days and then take it down after whatever happened, happened. So they stood up another Romania task force, which half of it is administrative to figure out what to do if, if you have to evacuate the embassy, and that's a good thing. So they yeah, yeah. set up the task force. We were, you know, have calling into them every time the Romanians let a call come through. But we had satellite phones, so we could do our thing if we needed to. Uh, and basically, we went out there after midnight, and all you saw were uh, people cleaning the streets. Uh, whatever water cannon, water sprayers they were using, they had hosed down the, the area completely. There were rumors that people had been shot, but you didn't see any bodies. We could see no evidence of blood or anything like that, but they were spending a very long time at, uh, late at night to clean up the street. Okay? In the morning, dry, totally clean of the 22nd. Yeah, okay? Yeah. Which is the day things cracked. So, we don't really know. I had, I had gone uh, home to sleep because I was up all night running around the city doing whatever crazy things they had us doing. Uh, I went home and I woke up about 10 in the morning or something and you could hear helicopters and stuff like this flying around. Security forces, stuff like that. What what had happened was Ceausescu got back, got back from uh, Iran maybe the Wednesday and we're talking all of this fun stuff happened Friday, the 22nd. Ceausescu uh, called another support rally. And that's when people uh, in, in the main square, again, three to 500 meters away from the uh, embassy, that's when people decided to start booing him. Right, right. Okay. And it got really bad. I wasn't there because I, I was walking back to the embassy after having tried to grab a few hours of sleep. You could see everything just insanely active in terms of the security services moving and helicopters and stuff little did i know one of the helicopters probably had Ceausescu in it i was walking back down to the embassy so sometime around 10 or 11 in the morning the booing got bad enough that the guy decided i'm taking off i'm getting in the helicopter and leaving so basically he did that we did not quite know that that was basically the equivalent of the guy fleeing. But when nobody stepped in to take over and to restore order, then things basically uh, turned into a celebration. So let's right. say around right. around 11 or 12 on the 22nd, things started to get crazy. Uh, they said, okay, well, he's not calling in on the radio from, you know, from one of the, you know, from one of his other staging points or office buildings around Bucharest. What's happened? It looked like the army had turned to the people's side. Okay. And then it looked like the army, it looked like the army has had decided to turn to the people's side. Okay, so there are, there's an expression, uh, armata ye kunoi, the army is with us. Everyone was running around saying, armata ye kunoi, they were going crazy with this. So they said, basically, that's what what was needed to get rid of Ceausescu, okay? Uh, right. People knew okay. there was a security service, but we didn't see it, okay? And so, what had happened, I will then turn, switch you over to the life of, a, of, a, of an American diplomat. It looked like Everything was done and it was peaceful. Midday on the 22nd. Now, what had happened in our in our own personal lives was that after the uh, the 17th of December and onward, uh, 
things were looking so dicey in Romania that people said, look, you know, we, you better not, if you have planned Christmas vacation, look, you'll, you'll take it in, in January. You'll take it in February. Don't worry. We'll get, you're not going to lose your leave, but you better stay. Things look like we're going to need you here. Okay. So they basically canceled all the voluntary leave. Okay. And so people were a little annoyed. They, they lost their Christmas vacations, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but on the 22nd, that Friday afternoon, it, it suddenly looked, eh, okay, things are fine. Yeah. And, and there were Western flights in the afternoon that leave every afternoon and go to the West, uh, Vienna, Frankfurt, uh, Paris. So basically, uh, the management of the embassy said, look, okay, peaceful. We can handle what's, what's happening. It doesn't look like it's going to require much more than just sort of political reporting and contacts with whoever, whoever emerges in the new government. So, you know, if you were a person on the admin side, you can, that you want to take your vacation, take your vacation. You can get on the, on the Friday afternoon flights and, you know, you can salvage most of your vacation. So we had, we had to set up a little convoy to go out to the airport Friday afternoon. Right. To take all the family members. I don't have a picture in there of that, but uh, the, so the same day that they're they're in front of the embassy cheering, okay, the picture that you saw you see there, yeah, they're out there do, they're out there doing that. No, no, the the, the two that you have with ambassador. No, oh, that's not okay. that's not yet, not yet. That's next phase. So we just took the people on the convoy up to the airport. Okay, I I had been in, I was an economic officer there, so part of the job that you handle is dealing with civil aviation, the bilateral aviation agreements, all that stuff, airlines. So, hey, Alec, you work you work with these guys at the airport. Go with the group that make sure that these guys get out safely. You know, we will, uh, you know, you take some admin guys, take one or two Marines uh, who will not show anyone that, that, you know, if they've got weapons or not in the car, and we'll just get our people that want to leave to the airport. So, we take our people to the airport. We get them on the planes. We're all happy. Who gets off the plane? No, I mean, who's coming to Romania in the middle of the revolution? Some journalists were trying to get in. Uh, they, when the Ceausescu regime was still in, they were blocking them. They weren't able to get in. Okay, a couple I think may have got off the plane then, but the head of the marine of our marine security guards gets off the plane. The only, the only guy from our staff that gets off the plane because he had been on vacation. He said, "I got to be back." You know, who knows what's going to happen next? And I got to be there to control my men because if he wasn't there as a military officer controlling the 15-person Marine guards, you, we don't have these in Thessaloniki, but we have them at the embassy in Athens. Usually you need, Marine, you need a full embassy for Marine guards, unless it's a place like Benghazi. But the, uh, but the issue is uh, he got off, and it was great that he came back. This is, we, call them the, we call the guy the gunnery sergeant because he was absolutely needed in the next phase to keep order in the embassy. Uh, and that's a that's military to military. These guys otherwise would report to the regional security officer in the embassy, who is a State Department civilian employee, many times ex-police, sometimes ex-military, but they're not really set up in the chain of command to control the day-to-day -day work of a Marine security guard group. Okay? So to have the gunny back was a great thing. So... He gets off the plane, we and we're heading back to the city. Our people are uh, are going to Frankfurt, wherever they're going. They're going to have Christmas vacation. The embassy is down about twenty percent of the population because of the people that got out on vacation. And we're driving back into the city, and it's about a seven eight kilometer run from the airport to the downtown where the embassy was in those days. We start to hear what sounds like fireworks going off. So we're getting closer to downtown. Wow, they must be having a great party. This is wonderful. Uh, they, they, they save the celebration for the evening. And as we get really close to the embassy, we realize it's gunfire. And it's not just a little. It was a lot of gunfire. You could hear, you could hear it five kilometers away, two kilometers away. It was deafening. What had happened was there was a, there was, there, there was a securitate uh, counterattack plan uh, that they had decided let's wait till it gets a little closer to dark to strike people and to, to hit to try to take back the key buildings downtown there were tunnels under all of the government buildings in the center of town and these guys had some weapon stockpiles that were not disclosed to the army 
So you have the security forces. The, the theory is that they actually had better weapons and better equipment than the army, but of course there weren't more of them than the army, but they were better organized and they were concentrated. So you basically had a securitate counterattack in the center of town. First job was to get all the people celebrating, like the guy that was in front of the embassy there, those trucks, to get them off the streets, scare them back in, into listening to the government. Then there would be messages from the government. And uh, Ceausescu had not stopped broadcasting messages at this point. So the issue was he decided to go into hiding a little later, but not quite at that point, mm -hmm. although there was a story of him being chased as soon as he got out of his, out of his helicopter in the provinces, okay? So there was no clear information about Ceausescu's and, in, and his wife's status. There was most, most of the reliable information coming in was from Radio Free Europe or the Voice of America. So everyone was tuned to that stuff or the BBC, whatever they could get. Uh, the, there, you could get the television channel in Timisoara. You could get Western TV, but you couldn't get it unless you had a satellite dish in Bucharest. So you really couldn't see that stuff there. Uh, so it was massive confusion. And that night was a really scary night with this counterattack going on for as long as it could. And so the, the call was made to get everybody, all the embassy staff out of their houses and, in, and to stay in the embassy compound, which you can see on the uh, left side. You can see the embassy, those the, the iron... Uh, grading. It's not the best security system. The, the embassy was an old banker's mansion that was converted. It's a wonderful old building. We don't have it anymore. We've we built a new building out by the airport, but that was the embassy for 40, 50 years. Beautiful building. And because it had a good wall around it, it was the safest place we really had. Okay. And because okay. there were some ancillary buildings in the back, there was actually room. You could, a lot of people could sleep there. So we basically said, everyone, come in. You are going to, on the night of the 22nd, you're sleeping here tonight. And so all our offices were turned into hotels. It's, it's, it, I can't say it's hilarious, but, you know, there's a couple of times I had to, had to sleep in my office. And sometimes even in my chair because people needed the cot. Because <laughs> we, had, we, we had everyone whose family did not evacuate, uh, not uh, evacuate, did not depart for vacation. Uh, right. We had them all, we had them all there. So... Then Washington said, okay, guys, this is really dicey. We are going to do an ordered departure. That's what we call it, ordered departure, as opposed to optional departure. When it is an ordered departure, uh, they're very cautious in Washington to do this kind of thing, to make that declaration, because that basically says all hell is broken loose. Nobody should any should think about going to the country uh, because nobody's uh, nobody in the embassy is there to, to protect you. You will, you know, you're, you're, you're basically out of luck if anything happens to you. So don't think about going to the country. A little bit like the COVID the warnings we saw last year. Don't think about traveling overseas. But order departure is really serious. When we, when we do that, it means there's no confidence in whoever's running the country. Okay, right, so right. we're afraid. Twelve noon. And if anyone else has a class and you need to to pop out, why don't you just do so quietly? This will be an ev ordered evacuation. And if you want to stay on, uh, uh, Mr. Malley is happy to finish the story. We haven't really got to the really interesting stuff and, well, uh, and make the connection. Christmas Day, Ceausescu shot. Yeah. And then everything calmed down. That's all you have to tell them, but you can show them pictures. Yeah, we, we the have a picture of the firing squad and the uh, and uh, and uh, I don't know. I think it was a painting that was done after the fact of the yeah. couple tumbling to the ground. But what a what an utterly frightening moment to be at the embassy. You're so close by. You can hear the gunshots, and you don't have clear information about what's happening. And uh, you've got to you know attend to the safety of whatever Americans happened to be in Bucharest at the time. And, and uh, Greeks and Greeks. We had Greek students in the convoy when we left too. Okay, and, and you were you told me you were responsible for actually uh, leading the convoy to the air, airport. We had a few pictures of that. So uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. But any of you, uh, Dinos and whoever else has a class at 12 noon and you feel the need to pop off, just go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we're going to continue our discussion now ever so briefly until we can see the rest of the photos and Mr. Malik can uh, finish this story. 
so here was the uh here was the convoy right alec it was over here somewhere no wrong way you'll find it you'll find it anyway basically it took a few days to organize the con the evacuation convoy which was on the 24th middle picture right here Mr. Took, i'm the guy in the middle i don't remember the, the, the name of that the the attractive woman behind me i should have got her phone number but i just convoy Convoy comrades. You, you, you sort of look like Bernie Saunders here in this attire. Is that what <laughs> Sanders nah, has? Just an old, it was just an old uh, coat I had bought in Poland years ago, but very warm. All right. And, and then would have been a lot of Americans who get on the airplane, right? Right. Okay. So basically, what they hit, what they did with an with an order departure, it means they pay your ticket home to Washington. Uh, and they'll when when it's time to go back to your posting, you will go back. Uh, so they basically said, look, guys, convoy for one hour through really dangerous, one hour of, of dangerous Romanian territory till you get to the Danube River, the town of Giorgiu and Ruse. There's a bridge across the Danube called the Friendship Bridge, and that's the closest point in Bulgaria. Uh, so the convoy had to work its way through that, and it took... Because of the, it took a lot of planning, a day or two of finding routes out of the city, south, to get to the highway to to uh, Georgiou and Ruse, uh, to to figure out which ways were safe. We had to use work with the defense attaché to sort of scout the routes and figure out which way to go. And at at the same time, the Brits joined us, the French joined us, the Greeks joined us. Everybody that had embassy, you know, embassy staff that could get in cars, you know, we set up. Some some marshalling points along the way. The main one was, you know, close to the embassy, but they had to meet. Most of the people had to meet us at another point and go on. We did because it was already after the uh, collapse of the Ceausescu gang. We did have a Romanian police escort. The problem was they were afraid Securitate would attack them. And no, and there were also rumors, and this was very serious. There were rumors that third world. Uh, let's say terrorist and guerrilla trainees that were rumored to be trained in Romania in training camps, that these guys were grabbed by the Securitate as additional fighters to fight in the city uh, against uh, the revolutionary forces, the uh, to fight against the good guys. So there were rumors that, you know, you could find an Arab or somebody who was normally a quiet student suddenly given a gun and said, shoot foreigners. Rumors. Nobody knew, but this stuff was just going around every 10 seconds. So the environment was extremely, extremely uh, fluid, and you, you had to work, you know, minute by minute in, in most cases. Anyway, the convoy got together. We got out. We got to the Bulgarian border. Bulgaria was safe because a month earlier the, the government had, the communists had, had sort of left power there. So it was, it was friendly territory. We went then. It's about a five-hour drive down the down to uh, Sofia with the roads they had back then. It's much faster now. But the uh, uh, they had hotels for us to stay. We just left our cars. Most of us took the private cars, left them in this one big parking area in Sofia, got on planes to Frankfurt first, and then wherever. I had to go. I was lucky. They told me, hey, stay, your wife is in Warsaw. Go see her. Stay with her. Stay close because we're going to call you back pretty soon. And a week later, you know, the call comes to get come back, but the uh, they left the embassy with a skeleton crew of the political appointee ambassador, his wife. She didn't want to leave. Okay. Uh, the DCM stayed. His wife left. His wife is is in that picture next to me in the back of the airplane. That's okay. Larry Knapp's wife back there, Mary. Oh, nice lady. Okay. Which no one can see, but it's at the back of the corridor of the plane. Over here. Uh, and. Uh, I was an economic officer that said, look, man, we're not doing any foreign trade for a week. Take a, take a week off. <laughs> uh, they kept a Hungarian-speaking person because we might have some outreach in Transylvania. Uh, and we always had one or two Hungarian speakers on the staff. Most of the rest of us learned Romanian. Uh, they kept one political officer, a press officer, and everybody else was just Marines and the security guys. To protect the ambassador, and so uh, it was the less than skeleton crew 
Okay, and Washington was not even not ha you know they said look try not to close it down, but they were not happy that the ambassador stayed, but they understood that the guy wanted to wave the flag, and it was his call. But the first of the in this panel of pictures, if you look up top, there's a bullet hole in the middle of the top picture. That's right. the apartment building I lived in. That's what I found when I got back. But I just show you that, you know, this is a like a kilometer and a half from where most of the fighting was going on, and there were still stray bullets floating around or flying around, okay? Another five meters over that would have been in uh, in one direction would have been in my apartment. But this was in the, the front area where the elevators were. So I was lucky there, okay? Then you have convoy, then you have the people on the plane, and then we can go to the next shots. Okay, so the next shot was the half track, right? Correct. Uh, no, mm -hmm. here's the half track. Okay. I mean, it should be in that. It should be in that uh, panel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is now like let's say ten days after the revolution, and it's, this is the academy building. But this is in the square where most of the shooting happened, and one of the tunnels came in, came down, came up pretty close to there. So that building had took a huge amount of fire. You can see the you can see the uh, half track over there, or a, or armored uh, APV. Uh, that's the other side of the square behind behind us, and they're already starting to clean up. January, and then down below is the American Library, and they were also pro-American in those days. Uh, they put the snowman there, but it also says something like the inscription that says, uh, "Victory, you're with uh, we're with you." Okay, not necessarily totally pro-American, but the fact that they put it there. In front of us, we're with you. Me is about as pro-American as you can be, okay? okay. But hey, listen, it was sort of once Ceausescu was shot, that basically was you know the 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 approach of cut the head off a snake. It seemed to work in this case, and things calmed down very quickly. That was the twenty fifth. By the twenty sixth, thing there was no gunfire at all, and so <clears throat> things. Was, you can't say return to normal, but stabilized because the, I mean the entire state bureaucracy was uh, was was changed. So what had basically happened? Now we can go to the last shots. Okay. The last panel. What had basically happened was the political transition. Okay. Well, one. Okay. Yeah. I don't have these in order here. Just in the order you sent them. Hold You've on. Seen them. Okay. Anyway, basically what was going on was uh, a period of the locals trying to figure out who their new rulers were, okay? The gang that took over, I call it gang because it, it was a group, it was called the FSN, the National Salvation Front. Uh, and that formed the government for until the, until, the, until the actual election. So basically, these were also nomenclatura, mostly ex-communists, or communists who just had not, were, were thrown out of power by Ceausescu because they weren't his particular gang. So these might have been more intellectual, more globalist, uh, you know, more cosmopolitan than Ceausescu's trusted men. Okay, so these were guys, and so these are these were actually in some cases people that we knew. Uh, you, we would consider them in some cases that these were. You know, once important politicians that were given jobs like working in that publishing house, which is the right. last thing at the bottom. You know, okay, harmless. It just this guy just does book reviews. Okay, he used to be you know the uh, the district leader for an important province, but no, no, we'll keep him in Bucharest close. We'll just have him you know handling book publishing. We'll tell him what books to publish. He'll just run the operation. So they found <clears throat> less important jobs to put these guys in. But they did not send them to concentration camps to, or do anything worse than that. So they were around. So, uh, And occasionally you would find one or two. You wouldn't usually find them at American embassy events. You could find them at uh, sometimes the French embassy reception. They would get away with inviting and people would get away with showing up to the, you know, because Romania and France had very close ties for a long yeah, time. Ties. Yeah. That was the time Mitterrand was president still. And so, and so 
some of these so-called dissidents would show up there. But anyway, it was a group of, of ex-communists who were outsiders who took over, including Jan Eliescu and Petre Roman, uh, who were, you know, for, in, our, in our eyes, this was, you know, I mean, we knew their background. We'd seen ex-communists make the move in, in other places in Eastern Europe. So the, the real question that emerged was, was this a coup d'etat or a revolution? Okay, and so the the last three panels, which just sort of go into that uh, that idea, the first one on top, you see people demonstrating in front of the building, which had been the foreign ministry, but then later, but the, the years I was working in the embassy, that was the foreign ministry. But the government decided this is a nice building. For now, we're going to use it. it uh, it's defensible. We're going to use it as the uh, as as the seat of government. So, you had increasingly rallies with an anti-communist character in front of the uh, in front of this building saying, look, we want something closer to democracy. When are we going to have elections? Blah, blah, blah. The guy in the middle, typical, you know, I mean, the, there's a great poster, which I didn't get a good picture of, but this is a, a fair representation. You see the guy with the, uh, with the hammer and sickle in the middle? He has, you know, typical Romanian fur hat on top, but FSN is the National Salvation Front. So he basically, he's basically saying these are just communists. So it's there's no real change. And so that was the debate, okay? There were steps taken to decommunize the place. Down below, you see them. This is a statue of, of none other than Comrade Lenin, who had been in front uh, of the... This, this is the... Romanian equivalent, the publishing house is Skintea, which means spark, and it's the uh, Romanian equivalent of Pravda. They, the two main newspapers were published there, and all the communist journals, blah, blah, blah. And so, of course, they had to have a Lenin statue there. I mean, that was ideologically, even though these guys weren't Soviet, and they weren't pro-Soviet, they still had respect for the the father of their ideology in that sense. So the Lenin statue was there until it wasn't there. And it was like a month later, they finally got rid of it. Uh, one other picture, which I didn't give you, shows some, the first American VIPs are there with me watching this thing go be, being taken down from the National Democratic Institute. And oh. the, uh, so we had NDI and NRI coming through. Basically what you had was a parade of American officials, so some of who were already working in Eastern Europe for two or three months before, as those countries had, had flipped over, trying to extend their programs into Romania as well. Basically, political party training, which is valuable everywhere. We still do it. We still do it in Kosovo today. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's money that is administered through the USAID, but we had to set up a special office in Washington to fast track uh, all the money to Eastern Europe because we we knew that AID normally was sort of working, an organization that worked in third world countries at a very much slower pace of, uh, you know, of, of the project delivery. So they decided, okay, let's put this, let's put a high powered panel of, of diplomats on top of this office of East European assistance and let's get rolling with the program. And so, they were throwing money at basically everybody to get out to East European countries. Uh, you know, you if you were a lawyer that wanted to work in Eastern Europe, they would send you out there to train lawyers in whichever country you liked or thought you knew a language from. So I mean, it was it was just it was a, a party for the uh, for both NGOs and and any organization that was doing a, in doing Washington projects. We call them Beltway Bandits in Washington. If you haven't heard that phrase, you will. Occasionally hear it in political debates, but these are organizations in Washington that live off of federal grants. Yeah, especially it became big business in the 1990s in the Clinton administration. Absolutely. Absolutely. So of the pictures, that's it. What are, what are other points you want to come up with? How well, there is, well I'm just, I don't think we have time for the, uh, for the work you did in the uh, State Department. Gee whiz, we have an awful lot of the, the young people who stayed on, and I'm grateful that you did. Uh, Alec, you, you did spend time working on, uh, I showed them the legislation, the Southeast European or Support for East European Democracy Act of 1989. And uh, you, uh, you left uh, 
Buda, uh, Bucharest, excuse me, you went on to spend time in Warsaw. Is that correct? Fantastic posting, yeah. Yes. And then you ended up in Washington, D.C. And maybe this will be sort of a coda here. What was the work that you were doing when you went back to Washington? Okay, that's, that's a good point. Okay, well, look, I had the I had the East European bug. I had, look, I had studied Soviet Soviet issues and East European issues at at school, and so this was you know in the blood, so to say. I did not know that I had really you know been was going to become sort of a Balkan expert at that time. It was more general, but I got an assignment to be the economic officer in the Washington office that used to be called East Europe, Yugoslavia. It got broken up when uh, when Clinton came in and assigned uh, Dick Holbrook as the Assistant Secretary for Europe and Eurasian Affairs. And when he came in in the beginning of 93 to reorganize, the it was called EEY, East Europe, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia had all, already fallen apart in 92, so they took the Y off the office's name. Then Holbrook came in and said, I'm going to reorganize Europe anyway. So among the other things he did, he took, he split it, the north and the south part of Eastern Europe into two different groups because of the sort of the different speeds at which the reforms were going on. So one office handled North Central Europe. The other office handled South Central Europe. Unfortunately, they put Romania in North Central Europe, even though it was the slowest of the uh, of, of the reforming group. But that's where it went. And the South Central Europe group, which is where I was, uh, that had been where I, I was working on those countries anyway, the Bosnia War, et cetera, was there, the sanctions on mm -hmm. Serbia. And so that's where I stayed. It just They just renamed the office. Uh, but taking Romania out was a big thing. The Bulgarians were very upset that they were like assigned to be, hey, we're in the South Central. And those Romanians, what do they do to be put in with Poland and Czech? The Czech Republic and Hungary. Come on, they're Balkans. Okay, so they were so the Bulgarian diplomats in Washington were very upset at this. Uh, but you know, the Danube River is was a natural split point. Okay, uh, Holbrook could have decided to keep Romania in the south, but that was a bit uh, that was a decision he, he did not opt to make. So the basic uh, sort of structure of the work we did in those years was humanitarian relief to Bosnia and sanctions to Serbia, on Serbia, uh, which the UN had imposed to try to get them out of Bosnia and to maybe convince them not to do anything in Kosovo, which didn't work. But the sanctions finally, finally, finally were a, you know, it wasn't the, the major part because it took military action to get them to the table in Dayton. But it basically, uh, you can thank us for the good work we did in creating most of the Balkan mafias. Because if it wasn't for the sanctions on Serbia, there would not have been so much profit in illegally shipping things into, into Serbia, which enriched these groups, which were the core elements that became mafias. We had trouble, among others, with people in Skopje. Not so much Albania, because they weren't running stuff into Serbia. But through Skopje and Bulgaria, a very big channel of supplies, some of which were originating in Greece. There were business people in Greece who were saying, sure, 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 we're, we're in with the sanctions. And uh, at night, things would go across the border. So you guys in Thessaloniki may know more about that than I do. But I know what I read and know what I saw whenever I came to visit. <clears throat> but those were years that I wasn't actually working in Thessaloniki. Okay, the Thessaloniki gig comes a little bit later, and we're going to say that. This isn't, of course, necessarily. But I will ask you this. Did you have a feeling when you were based in Thessaloniki that Greece is part of the Balkans? Yeah, but listen, absolutely one feels it. You know that it's the European Union and on a faster development track. And also because of the Mediterranean uh, weather characteristics and, and environmental characteristics, you, you feel very differently when you see how much colder it is up there. Uh, but also because of the polit Greece's political history, it pulls you in a different direction. Okay? I mean, be because there was something way before the Turks took over Greece that was at a very, very high, uh, both developmental level 
economic level and political level, uh, it's, it, it is separate. But because the, the border is right there and because the population interchange is right there, you feel it. Thessaloniki, you absolutely feel it. Athens, you don't. You only feel it when you go into neighborhoods where you can hear Bulgarian, Romanian, Albanian spoken, which I, I hear all the time because I can identify the languages or Polish. I mean, but whatever. I mean, just places where there are immigrant uh, immigrant communities, so you hear the languages, you know it. Uh, but absolutely, Thessaloniki, no question, and maybe the line of where the Balkans is should be Tempe or someplace like that. Okay. You know. I don't want to get into that because then you get into other people's political philosophy of what territory should be Greece and what isn't Greece. Okay, ah. and I always, am, I'm, I will always support the current borders. Yeah, well, that was our that was our deal in uh, Yugoslavia also. <laughs> I did remind the students that you had these competing ideologies: Greater Albania, Greater Serbia, Greater Bulgaria, and it goes back to the Magali that uh, you're Greek. Uh, we need not uh, concern ourselves with that too much. Woman. Uh, yeah, but actually, every country, every country has a medali there of some kind, so that's the problem. Exactly. This is really instru uh, instructive. Now, the course that I teach is uh, uh, U.S. policy in Southeast Europe, and I had a common acquaintance, a mutual acquaintance, come and speak to the students some years ago, uh, Ambassador Mike Einick, who spent time in Romania after you left. And I said, "Well, what what do you think about U.S. policy in Southeast Europe?" And he said, policy, I didn't know we have one. And your sense of US foreign policy in this part of the world, is it coherent? Is there coordination? Is it something that's sort of ad hoc? At the time we wanted to, we wanted to contain the spread of communism, contain the influence of the Soviet Union. But to what extent is there after 1989, a U.S. policy in Southeast Europe. Maybe we'll end on that note. Yeah. Okay. It's it's, it, look, it's a very interesting question. It's it's a question of philosophy because basically the idea is you want all of Eastern Europe to eventually join the European Union. And if you work from that, if you work from that playbook, then everything else is how much can we help advance this without picking up most of the costs because the benefits will go to the EU. Therefore, you want the process to accelerate. You want to make sure there's no backsliding, which happens a lot in the region. You sometimes have to intervene, and we've had to intervene militarily when Europe just wanted to talk. And so the, I think the overall policy is, okay, it's an area that you know is eventually going to be, all of the region is going to become EU members. It's just a question of when. And it's how can we help uh, without like I say, footing the bill and committing, you know, troops or treasure at, uh, in high quantities. Uh, we were not able to avoid the, uh, the commitment for Kosovo for sure. Right. And, uh, and so basically, and so basically then the question is, okay, we're in the mode of helping advance this. And sometimes we get very, very aggressive. Sometimes we are, basically filling in. I think in the Trump administration years, basically the, the top guys in the Trump administration, except for John Bolton, did not pay much attention. Uh, Bolton was was aware of this stuff and, you know, he knew, I can't say he knew it like the back of his hand, but he understood it. The, uh, the career diplomats at state did a lot and probably a lot of that was unsupervised. Oh, really? really? I think in, ter in terms of advancing the stuff, I think our position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Macedonia may, may have been more forward-leaning than the very senior levels of the U.S. government ever thought we needed to be. I think one day maybe somebody will write something that says, why did we hurt Greece in order to get the Prespice Agreement the way we got it? And when, when we say hurt Greece, it means support uh, the previous government, the government of Prime Minister Tsipras, for a longer period of time than maybe it would have survived had the Americans not found it useful for the Prespice Agreement. That's 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 all something for somebody to write. Maybe me. I don't know. But the issue is the uh, good book, good book title. But the issue is, uh, could Greece be farther along in development if uh, 
the, the government that's in power now had been elected a year or two earlier. Okay. And if, if it had not been, so the basic point was the guys in Washington and we're talking about senior diplomats, but not senior state department officials. So assistant secretaries who are career guys, uh, and knew exactly what the region needed, but may not have bothered to inform their bosses. Injected <laughs> themselves more. Injected yeah. themselves more, more act, a little bit more actively than 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 was needed. And that, that that's something that can be debated when we see, eventually, the historians see the memos that were sent up. Okay. It may be that maybe the secretary Pompeo said, "Look, this sounds good. Do it." Okay. You know, maybe they gave him two words of a briefing and it's, oh, great, fine. Let's solve this 25-year-old problem. Let's get it. Let's, let's do it. And not, and there was no consideration of what is the cost to Greece in terms of economic development. It wasn't that great of a cost, but what it is. And then what is the connection? This is the most important part. What is the connection between our policy with Turkey and our dealings with Greece in terms of what, give and take there might be with, with Southeast Europe. Okay? okay. Is there a connection? Maybe there's no connection. Maybe there's a con an unspoken connection, something that needs to be investigated. I worked on the Greek desk as, um, uh, among other places, also in Washington. I never saw it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay. All right. That's excellent. And it's really great that you're able to tie your experience as a diplomat working on Greece or in Greece. So we'll leave it at that. And I just want to, uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the students who stayed on uh, until this uh, extended uh, discussion is over. Thank you, Alec Malley, once again. Mm -hmm. And for any of you, uh, as I'm looking at Stephanos in particular, one of the American citizens who's uh, enrolled in the class. Any of you would like to uh, converse with uh, Mr. Malley uh, informally after class, uh, we, we can arrange that very easily. As you can see, he's quite a sociable and informative and informal uh, personality at this point in time. So we can arrange that with great pleasure. Uh, we could also talk about Albania at another point in time because I have some students from Albania in the class, but let's leave it. Alec, I want to thank you once again for coming.